dear yes. guests, um, dear Donna, Alex, Tobias, and Nikolai, and dear fellows. Uh, my name is Benno Herz, and as the current program director, I would like to warmly welcome you to the Garden of the Thomas Mann House for this special event. It is a real privilege to celebrate and to discuss Thomas Mann's Los Angeles stories from exile 1940 to 1952 at this site today, as the family who lived and worked here in this house takes center stage in the book and the stories we would like to present today. Today's event means a lot to me as it is connected to so many people who have been crucial for our work here at the house in the last years. In spring 2020, when we found ourselves amidst a global pandemic in an empty house, we thought about ways of getting the stories that surround and shape this place back out into the world at a time when no in-person events were possible. Nikolai and I began writing little pieces on certain aspects of the man's life in the city, their experiences and their interactions with the emigre community for our social media channels. The family's many political activities um, within the city, the frequent public appearances, their various theater and restaurant visits, and their big circle of friends. Every anecdote opened up new interesting perspectives on this history and new people and places for us to explore. We soon began inviting friends and colleagues and fellows of the house to join us in writing these little posts about the family's life in Los Angeles. We gathered photographs and maps to indicate and to connect the people and places that were of important to the Mans and the emigre community. And we speculated on what they might tell us about the city today. Some of the topics and issues that were of concern in the 1940s turned out to be surprisingly timely today. As the pandemic went on and more and more stories seemed too interesting not to tell, the stories got longer and the network of friends who were willing to t help us to tell these stories grew. When we finally approached Angel City Press with the idea of a book in spring 2021, we were delighted to learn that they were on board. Since 1992, Angel City Press has been such an important outlet for the stories of Southern California and Los Angeles. As chroniclers of the rich cultural history of the American West, they published books such as Becoming Los Angeles, Myth, Memory, and a Sense of Place by DJ Waldy, or, um, for example, Pat Morrison's very beautiful book, Rio LA, Tales from the Los Angeles River. But before we dive deeper into the topics of the book uh, on our panel today, I would like to use this opportunity um, to thank my dear colleague Nikolai Blaumer, the co-editor and co-author of the book. Nikolai was the inaugural program director of the Thomas Mann House, and since 2018 he had been shaping and building this house as a cultural space and residency center, really from the ground up. I was given the opportunity to work with him in 2019, and since then he has be become a trusted mentor, a really helpful teacher, and a dear friend to me. In May this year, uh, Nikolai sadly left LA for Germany, together with his um, lovely baby daughter, Mala, and his wife, Tina. And I'm very happy that he was able to join us in LA for today's event, which is also a wonderful opportunity to honor Nikolai for his important work for the house and thank him for his fruitful time in Los Angeles. Thank you, Nikolai. <laughs> So we would also like to thank all of the authors, all of the over 40 authors who contributed to the book with such revealing, well-crafted, witty, informative, and sometimes humorous pieces. Um, this, this book wouldn't have been possible without this remarkable group of authors from such different backgrounds. Um, and some of them are here in the audience today, and we are very delighted that three of the authors will actually be here on stage with us today. Donna Rifkind, author of the truly remarkable and important book, The Sun and Her Stars, Salka Viertel and Hitler's Exiles in the Golden Age of Hollywood. Tobias Bös, author of the seminal book, Thomas Mann's War, Literature, Politics, and the World Republic of Letters. And Alex Ross, who just recently pub published a critically acclaimed book called Wagnerism, Art and Pollux in the Shadow of Music. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for being here with us today. We would like to especially thank Alex Ross for his continued support for the Thomas Mann House. As a member of our advisory board, he has been such an important ally and advisor uh, for the house and his work 
has been a source of inspiration for our programs in the last years. Yeah, we would also like to thank um, Villa Aurora and Thomas Mannhaus for supporting this publication, especially Markus Klimmer, Heike Mertens, Stephen Levine, and our new executive director in Berlin, Jakob Scherer. Um, but also, of course, our dear colleagues here in Los Angeles at Villa Aurora, Claudia Gordon and Friedel Schmoranzer, who also both contributed to the, to the book as well with two very moving pieces on Martha and, Leo, uh, and Leon Feuchtwanger, of course. Um, many thanks to the archives and archivists who assisted us in our work and have allowed us to include many of the images in the book, especially Michaela Ullmann at the USC Special Collections Library and uh, the, the Thomas Mann archives in Zurich, just to name a few. Uh, thanks to Lena Trüper and Julia Welter for their amazing support acquiring and managing all the image rights for the book. And we would, of course, also like to cordially, cordially thank everyone at Angel City Press. Uh, Paddy Calistro and Scott McAuley have been incredibly helpful with conceiving the broader picture of the project, crafting the various ideas and contributions into a coherent book. Um, Terry Akomazo, the executive editor at Angel City Press, who worked uh, closely together with us, did a terrific job rounding out the book as a whole and especially making our German English sound a bit more elegant. <laughs> Um, thank you, Terry. Um, we are so grateful for the artist John Stitch and his truly amazing illustrations. His maps, portraits, and landscapes are really integral to the spirit of the book, I think. Many thanks, thanks also to Jim Schneeweiss and Cindy Olnick for their help organizing events and programs around the uh, publication. And last but not least, I would like to thank my team here at the Thomas Mann House. Julia Welter, who really has been a driving force behind the organization of this event and the book release, Emily Lacco, Katrin Klüppel, Emily Visoki, and uh, Betty Ramirez. The list of people we could and would like to thank could go in, on and on, and I hope I did not forget anyone. Um, but just by glancing in the crowd, I can see many familiar faces um, and wonderful supporters of our house, for which we are very grateful. Um, especially Shirley Price, our dear neighbor, an important facilitator here in the neighborhood. But we're also very much honored that today uh, Larry Schoenberg is here in the audience and also Nikola Lubitsch. It's truly an honor and a privilege to have you here at the Thomas Mann House. This book and today's event um, are meant uh, to honor and uh, to commemorate the legacy of the many women and men who had to flee Germany and Europe because of the atrocities of the Nazis. It is with great pleasure to now introduce you to the German Consul General in Los Angeles, Stefan Schneider, who also contributed to the book with a wonderful and witty piece on the novelist Christopher Isherwood. Um, and afterwards, we will have a conversation with our uh, fantastic guests today, and there will also be a chance to ask questions. Thank you all very much, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just looking for the shade. So I know I look like a security guy, but I have some problems with the eyes. So <laughs> it makes me more important with the glasses, I think. Ladies and gentlemen, dear editors, congratulations first of all, Benno and Nikolai. This is a great, great, great project. And of course, as you know me, I always have some remarks to be a little bit teasing. Do you know what a coffee table book is? You have that all at home. It's some things like a kind of illustrated book, royal corgis in England in the 19th century, for example. <laughs> That's a coffee table book. Or opium pipes of the world. <laughs> or things like Lithuanian classical uh, tablecloth, something like this, and all people are interested. And you think it's the same thing, because there are very many authors, very many ni nice pictures and writings. It is not a coffee table book. You could do it as a coffee table, but it's a piece of conversation. It's a conversation piece. And if you open it, and that's the only similarity with the coffee table book, is on all two pages, three pages, there's a new story. There's a new article. There are new photographs. All aspects of Thomas Mann, they are really kind of uh, pointed at. Interesting enough, I would 
recommend all of you to have the book always with you. When you're in the Pacific Palisades, Los Angeles or Santa Monica. You see, I make the distinction here between this is a kind of ivory tower, whatever thing here. Santa Monica are people like, you know, they have their the SUV car that bring the poodles to have the nails done, okay? And Los Angeles is the rest of it. Okay, that's Hollywood and all that stuff. But take the book with you because you will, wherever you are in this in these area, in this area, you will find a place you will like. And I assure you, you open the book and Thomas Mann was already there. <laughs> that's an interesting experience. I normally go to Will Rogers Beach here, it's close by. He was there too. You know the, the uh, Baywatch? You know Baywatch? <laughs> I mean, all these handsome guys and girls saving toddlers and uh, old ladies or blonde ladies and there's a shark and all that. Thomas Mann was already there. You learn that <laughs> in the book. They are not mentioning Baywatch. Of course not. It's not very academic anyway. But I wish you were all the best reading that book. And I really congratulate again the, all the authors and the co-authors and all people who were involved. And I guess you should have a second edition or a kind of follow-up book. You should have a follow-up book about the bad sides about the size of Thomas Mann. That would be very interesting. You know, it's like, it's number two. We have, there is one very famous book on art history, The Beauty. Beauty, Umberto Eco, I think is that one. There should be another one, The Ugly Sides. Could be interesting, especially here, right? So we are looking forward to the discussion. And thank you very much for the initiative. And Nikolai Blama is back, and we are really glad to have him here because he has to be in Berlin. I mean, it's not the worst of all places, but of course, he had to, to go, go away from this wonderful house. And thank you for your, for your presence, especially this day, because normally you go on the beach, well, Rogers Beach or wherever you go. Or you are here with us and celebrate. Thank you very much. And we are looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for your generous kind introduction, dear Benno and dear Stefan. It's good to be back here at this very special place um, together with guests and supporters who helped us to put the Thomas Mann House on the map in recent years. Um, acclaimed literary critic and author Donna Rivka and author of the book The Sun her and Her Stars on Zyka Füttel, Alex Ross, um, a New Yorker music critic and author of books like The Rest is Noise, uh, listen to this, and most recently, Wagnerism, and like Benno said, a very valuable, crucial member of our advisory board, a close friend and helper in every way is uh, here at the Thomas Mann House. And Tobias Bös, a literary scholar from the University of Notre Dame, uh, who recently published the book Thomas Mann's War, which came out also in German language now at Weilstein Verlag this year. Give it up to all three of them, first of all. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you. And let's dive right into the topic. And keep in mind, we would love to have you join us in the second half of this event and make them think already about potential questions. And you're warmly invited um, to get into conversations with all of us um, yeah, in the second half of uh, this afternoon. Maybe you can start, Alex, um, by, in a way, chrono chronologically, by the early wave of European migration to Los Angeles. You told us that you are currently working on a new project and um, you're doing research on the 1920s um, and this first wave of intellectuals and creative people who came here to Los Angeles. A while ago, I read the travelogues of Erika and Klaus Mann, who were the first members of the Mann family who came to Los Angeles in 1926. Uh, the travel reports are also published in a really nice book, valuable to read. And for me, I have to admit, it was a surprise how many stars from the German-speaking world they already met here in Los Angeles. People like Emil Jannings, um, also Ernst Lubitsch, people like the architects um, Schindler and Neutra lived here already then from the end of the 20s on Zyka Viertel. 
and usually we associate when we talk about the exiles or the emigre community about a later period, right, from the 30s on. And I was wondering in which sense did this first generation emigres to LA set the stage then for this German colony uh, which came here then after the Nazis took power in Germany? Uh, yes, uh, of course. Um, it's a, a delight to be here and it was a delight to be a part of this uh, book. I think it's a wonderful book and, and it is uh, centered on Thomas Mann, but uh, I think it's also uh, a great encyclopedic picture of this remarkable world, which uh, was built up over many years, um, uh, predominantly in, in this case, uh, German speaking uh, people who settled here and, and had extraordinary effect on all aspects of the arts. And for me personally, it's, it's a story that has always fascinated me. When I first visited Los Angeles in uh, the late 1980s, having grown up on the East Coast, um, really the, the first things I wanted to do was not to look at the Hollywood sign or anything like that, but I wanted to drive around and see Thomas Mann's house and Arnold Schoenberg's house and uh, uh, the Adorno duplex <laughs> and uh, all these other um, uh, sort of semi-visible or invisible uh, monuments of the uh, emigration uh, because uh, these were figures uh, who had been so important um, to me, uh, uh, getting to know 20th century uh, culture, literature, and, and music. Um, uh, so yeah, I've decided to embark upon my next book uh, as, as a history of the German-speaking immigration from the, from the early 20s to the uh, early 50s. Um, and uh, Donna, I think, can, can shed a lot of light on this question. But yeah, I don't think you can understand the later uh, uh, emigre world uh, without looking at its roots uh, in the 1920s, because it wasn't as if all these people were just dropped out of a helicopter and, and sort of deposited here blinking in the sun. I mean, there were so many networks uh, and connections that would have drawn uh, people here. Um, you know, Hollywood was the obvious destination for those who were working in the, the German uh, film world, it was inevitable that, that Billy Wilder uh, uh, and, and other people are going to end up here. Uh, but sort of the other connections are less obvious. So w when I look back, uh, and of course there have been German speaking people in Southern California all along. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the California gold rush uh, began on the property of uh, John Sutter, a Swiss German. Uh, a very interesting uh, character who had all kinds of adventures and, and misadventures. Um, and there were, there were German-speaking people involved in the film world right from the start. Uh, Carl Lemley, one of the, one of the original uh, studio chiefs, uh, was uh, German from Laubheim. Uh, Eric von Stroheim uh, had a brief, spectacular, eventually disastrous uh, career as a, as a uh, director uh, starting in, in 1919. But if I were to sort of pick a starting point, I would actually pick the year 1922, exactly 100 years ago. Uh, because in that year, uh, R.M. Schindler, an uh, uh, Austrian architect who had been in America since 1914, uh, settled in LA. Uh, he had been working here for a couple of years, but he decided to settle here. And he built this extraordinary house on King's Road. Uh, and I hope some of you have uh, seen the house on King's Road, uh, and if not, uh, uh, do visit it. It is celebrating its uh, centenary this summer. Um, and it is sometimes described as the world's first modern house. It's certainly the beginning of this remarkable wave of modernist residential architecture um, in Southern California. Uh, and uh, Richard Neutra followed uh, Schindler here, uh, and there are several other uh, very uh, creative uh, uh, architects with a German background, uh, including J.R. Davidson, uh, who designed uh, this house. Um, uh, not quite the same mentality um, as the, uh, the modernism of, of Neutra or even that of Schindler, but an important figure. So that was happening. Um, and then in the same year, uh, uh, December of 1922, Ernst Lubitsch uh, uh, arrived in Los Angeles, one of the world's most famous uh, film directors at that time. Uh, had become internationally known for, for these spectacular uh, costume uh, period dramas, Madame du Barry and, and, and several others. Um, but of course, his great forte, uh, as he would prove uh, settling here, was the sophisticated 
comedy, uh, social comedy, romantic uh, comedy uh, satire. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the arrival of Lubitsch, um, and it is a great honor to have uh, Nikola Lubitsch uh, with us uh, uh, today, um, was, uh, you know, the, he brought so many people with him or so many people followed him. Uh, 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 technicians uh, in the film world, cinematographers and, and uh, costume designers and, and uh, art directors, composers, producers. Uh, and so there was this kind of small army uh, of people who followed Lubitsch. And this, I think, was, was really uh, the beginning of, of the German-speaking uh, film colony. Uh, so as the 20s went on, more and more people arrived. And there were beginnings of of these literary uh, connections, uh, as well as well-known German-speaking authors uh, began to associate themselves with Hollywood with the help of, of these uh, connections that existed, um, which is perhaps the moment to hand things over to Donna, uh, because in, in the, the late 20s, uh, we have the arrivals of, of the Fiertels, uh, who would be so important in terms of the, the expansion of this, uh, of this world. But I'll, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you, Alex. And <clears throat> thank you to the Thomas Mann House. And, and congratulations on this very important document that you have put together um, on the subject of the anti-fascist immigration to Los Angeles. And as Alex was saying, the, the question often is, why did people who uh, were forced to leave Europe come to Los Angeles? Why didn't they go to New York or Chicago or any other American city? And the, the partial answer is yes, that they felt that they could get uh, jobs in Hollywood. But I think a more complete answer is that when you are forced to leave your home and you don't really know how to operate in a foreign country, you go where you know people will take you in. People who have already laid the groundwork and can introduce you to people and show you how, what you need to do to survive in an exotic environment. So Salka Fiertel and her husband Berthold, as Alex said, came to Los Angeles in 1928. Um, they were by no means the first uh, of the theater and film community in Germany to come. Um, and uh, they came and immediately met people like Emil Jannings and, and the film community here. Uh, Salka's husband Berthold had been offered a contract with Fox Film Corporation to write the films of F.W. Murnau. And so they, the Viertels had had an experimental theater company in Berlin that had gone bankrupt during the period of hyperinflation. And they thought, well, we'll come to Los Angeles, we'll rebuild our finances, we'll stay five years, and then we'll go back to Germany. So that was the plan. Of course, it didn't work out that way. Um, but they came in 1928 and uh, immediately fell in love with the neighborhood of Santa Monica and um, they, they uh, established themselves in this sort of modest family home, right, uh, with a view of the water and uh, eventually brought their three little sons over from Germany. And Berthold established himself um, fairly well in, in the studio, the sort of beginnings of the studio uh, system, uh, first at Fox and then at Paramount. Um, and as time wore on, uh, the end of the, thir of the 20s, the beginnings of the 1930s, they were starting to hear rumblings of how difficult things were for Jews and anti-fascists in Germany. Salka was not the least bit surprised by this because she herself, as a former actress and um, a theater director and a member of a theater company, had witnessed all sorts of acts of anti-Semitism in the various European capitals where she had worked. And so it was not surprised. But by 1933, it was clear that, um, you know, think people were going to have to leave. So it was at that point, um, sort of unofficially, that Salka, who had uh, just became a screenwriter at MGM for the films of Greta Garbo, kind of established herself as a... Um, a sort of ambassador for people who were coming. For, certainly, she, she served that purpose for Murnau, who had, had been here earlier, but, but then for Sergei Eisenstein and for other European filmmakers, she came and she made things easier for them in Los Angeles. She spoke eight languages. She um, was a natural connector of people. I don't know, maybe you know people who are like that, or maybe you are one yourself, but she had this, this magnetic talent for... Um, introducing people to each other in a way that was very productive for them. So 
that sort of laid the groundwork for this sort of rising tide of emigre that started to launch themselves out of Europe at the time. Um, and she developed into a very important person in this, in this anti-fascist network. Um, there were people trying to get people out of Europe but there were also people in America trying to help them fit in once they got there. Yeah, that's really fascinating to hear as a motivation. When Benno and I do tours here at the house, a lot of people ask us, oh, what were the motivations for Thomas Mann, but also his contemporaries, to come to Los Angeles? And usually people guess our oh, Hollywood career aspirations and the sunny weather. And uh, that's probably part of the answer about the supporting structures. Uh, through personal connections, but also formal institutions then later on was also kind of a pull factor to LA instead of um, Chicago or New York, like you said. And do you want to explain a bit or tell us a bit more about the institutions that were then implemented in a way from the end of the 30s on like the European Film Fund and maybe especially the role of women also, if you like. Yes, yes. It's when I started my research and I would read these massive you know, histories of the anti-fascist emigration, I was a little bit surprised to see no mention of the role of women in these histories, where they are clearly half of the population, if not more. And it was curious to me also in the, in the uh, histories of Hollywood that there was very little mention of women's roles. This has changed now in both of those arenas, but at the time when I started my research, you would have thought that there were no women in the studio system in Hollywood. And in fact, they were in every corner of the studio. They worked as in just about every job, except, of course, the top, you know, really glamorous jobs. Um, and I thought, where are all these women? Um, and luckily, things are changing now. We know um, through many, through, through lots of scholarship and research that we're, we're seeing these women highlighted. But, but I think that's a very good point that um, it wasn't just the men who were going through this trauma. It was, it was you know wives and daughters and, and you know, all of the women as well. Salka Virtol herself was a very, uh, she, the, the word activist had not been invented yet, but that's exactly what she was. She was, even in Europe before she had come to America, she was very involved in theatrical labor unions and in, in all kinds of um, activism. And so it was natural for her to be a part of these institutions, as you say, that, were, that arose to help uh, immigrants come uh, to get, it, to get them out of Germany and to get them into the United States. And, and one of those premier institutions was the European Film Fund, which was a grassroots organization. Once it was fairly well uh, established that the, uh, the presidential administration was not gonna do a lot to help people emigrate from uh, Europe, uh, the sort of prevailing notion was uh, sympathy, but not hospitality. So. The, there was a movement in Hollywood to say, well, what can we do um, on our own to get, you know, to get what people needed to get out? And so they established a fund where studio employees would give a percentage of their monthly salary into the fund, and that money would be uh, used for um, the immense amount of paperwork that was needed in order for people to emigrate. They needed affidavits. They needed uh, proof of employment once they got to America. They needed um, you know, uh, citizenship papers, all kinds of things, proof of citizenship. And so, um, as well as money, they needed a lot of money. So these, uh, the uh, founders of the European Film Fund were very high profile men. They were Paul Kohner, they were Ernst Lubitsch, lots of um, Hollywood no notables. But the, but the people who kept the European Film Fund going were two women. Um, and that was Charlotte Dieterle, the wife of the director William Dieterle and Liesel Frank, who was the wife of the uh, novelist Bruno Frank. And um, together they uh, sort of wrestled with this mountains of paperwork that needed to uh, be gone through in order for people to get out. And so um, there is more attention now on them, but uh, there was not a huge amount of uh, a paper trail left because a lot of the European Film Fund's activity was actually illegal. Um, they were doing things the government would have frowned on, although they wouldn't have admitted it. So there, there's a little bit of documentation, but not a lot. And so I think that's one of the reasons that their roles were not especially highlighted. Thank you. 
let's bring Thomas Mann into the picture. <laughs> and in your brilliant book, Thomas Mann's War to Be Us, there's this impressive map uh, with markers all over the United States where Thomas Mann uh, spoke publicly. And there's also, of course, a marker in Los Angeles. Um, his first public appearance here in the city, or his first visit to LA, was in 1938. Uh, he de delivered a lecture at Shrine Auditorium close to USC campus, uh, several thousand listeners then. And I was wondering who was his audience and also what motivated Thomas Mann to this really exhausting, challenging uh, lecture tours all over the years. I think three all in all. Thomas Mann was already in the 60s, so what kept him doing, kept him doing this? I do want to thank both of you for putting together this not only very important volume, but also a really fun volume. I had a lot of fun working on it, and I had even more fun reading the final um, product, and I think that's, that's important to, to stress. Um, so you asked, you asked sort of two separate questions. First of all, what, what brought ordinary Americans to see um, uh, Thomas Mann, and then um, what, what brought him uh, here? Um, that's, um, the, the, the answer to the first part of that question is, is going to take a little bit of time to, to, to unfold, because it's not, uh, a, uh, um, it's not an obvious uh, thing that Americans in the 1920s and 1930s would have taken an interest in Thomas Mann, who was, after all, a very difficult author and a very dramatic uh, author as well, right? So why did he enjoy these, these huge crowds? And um, it has partly to do, I think, with just sheer temporal luck. Uh, in German, we have uh, this wonderful phrase, die Gnade der spielten Geburt, which is oftentimes uh, the, the grace or blessing of late birth, which is generally applied to um, the generation who uh, was born in the late 1930s and or early 1940s and, and uh, had the blessing of not having had to interact with the Nazi regime. And something can be said for uh, Thomas Mann in the United States in relationship to the First World War. So um, Thomas Mann uh, began writing in the late 1890s, of course, and uh, uh, became quite famous internationally very early in his career, in the early 20th century already. But he was widely translated first in, uh, in Eastern Europe, especially in Russia and in Northern Europe, and really not at all in uh, the Western European languages, neither in English nor in French, were there any translations or at least any impactful translations before the end of the First World War. And the First World War was sort of a, a, a big reset button for the reception of German culture in the United States because you know, the United States was at war with, with Germany and suddenly everything that was German uh, was, was no longer palatable. Um, and by the time that Thomas Mann then began being translated into German in the early to mid-1920s, there was a a gap, uh, something that needed to be, or uh, uh, that, that Thomas Mann was, was, was able to fill in the reception of German culture uh, in the United States. And Thomas Mann by that, by that time had, had made his Republican turn. He had, had uh, sort of, was no longer actively publishing in the sort of uh, conservative nationalist vein that he had done in the teens. He had, uh, um, he had um, expressed his support for the Weimar Republic. Um, and so when, when Thomas Mann arrived on the American stage, he was sort of primed to be the representative of a, um, of a new Germany. And the people who, the people on the institutions also, who uh, disseminated Thomas Mann's image uh, uh, in America were quite um, adept at, uh, at propagating um, that, particular, um, that particular image. Um, and Thomas Mann was also... I think uniquely suited to be propagated in that fashion because he was such a, um, there's this paradox in Thomas Mann that on the one hand, he was quite aware that his, uh, uh, that an international reputation was important for him and uh, he let people, he was welcoming to people who wanted to sell him in other countries. Uh, yet at the same time, he, was, he did not take an interventionist role in that process himself. So he became a projection surface, I think, uh, for uh, many different kinds of audiences that could project uh, uh, different things upon him. And by the time in the late 1930s that he uh, finally personally arrives in the United States, so he makes his first trip to um, America, to the East Coast, in 1934, and then he um, settles permanently in 1938. 
and then of course relocates to the West Coast uh, in the early 1940s. Um, so by the time that he arrives permanently in the United States, the image that is being projected onto him is already that of a, um, a counterpart to Hitler. And not just a counterpart in the sense that he spoke out publicly against Hitler, which he did, but also a counterpart in the sense that Hitler was this, this loud mouth, you know, this, this very vulgar uh, kind of figure. And Thomas Mann was the exact opposite of that, was, was uh, clearly, he had this, I mean, he personified culture, right? Uh, and so he, uh, it was very easy to promote him as the sense of an enduring, um, uh, not just German, but European cultural value and essence um, that, uh, uh, that had been quite actively promoted in the United States already during the 1920s. Um, uh, it was easy for his promoters in the United States uh, for instance, his publisher, Alfred A. Knopf, or uh, Harold R. Pete, who was his lecture promoter, who sent him on lecture tours throughout the United States, as this sort of, um, this, this impersonation of, of German and European um, culture and, and a counterpart to Adolf Hitler. And so the people who, the Americans who streamed uh, to, to hear him lecture throughout the United States, including in 1938 here in LA, um, they were very interested in seeing a figure that had already been uh, established as a, as a celebrity at that, uh, at that point, but also they were interested in seeing this, this figure of, of sort of elevated uh, Germanness and elevated, elevated culture that they could um, receive. And uh, they really were ordinary um, uh, Americans. They were not just sort of uh, the educated elite um, although those certainly came as well. And, and here in, uh, in LA, there was also a, very much a celebrity element attached to it. But when he appeared, and he, he really, I mean, he, he spoke in places like Tulsa or Seattle, which in the 1930s was really out in the sticks, right? Um, uh, when, he, when he spoke in, in, in places like that, ordinary uh, Americans showed up, uh, drawn by this very enigmatic figure, Oftentimes, probably hadn't even read uh, uh, Thomas Mann, but then picked up his his books at those lecture tours. Um, and to to answer the second part of your question as to uh, what uh, what draws uh, uh, Thomas Mann, so he he arrives here first uh, as as part of those lecture tours, and then I think the uh, the allure of um, uh, of Los Angeles for him when he finally decides to relocate here permanently is actually, I would argue, the exact opposite of what, what Donna just uh, described. So most people, most emigres came, as, as, as you said, uh, because there were other emigres here and there were networks and so on. Thomas Mann was already very well established. He had his own networks in on the East Coast. He didn't necessarily need that, although I'm sure they, they were very welcome to him, those networks. Um, but I think by the time that, that the 1940s roll around, he's he's had his share of fame in the United States already. He's done his share of lecturing. And one appeal of um, of Los Angeles is that it, it, uh, it he sees in it a sense uh, or an opportunity to return to his fiction. He's working on the on the final volume of the Joseph Tetralogy at that point. Uh, it's been delayed by a number of years already. He finally needs to wrap up this novel cycle. Uh, and there's, uh, and, and, and LA seems to him to be the place to finally do that, to get away a little bit from Princeton where he was before. We had a, where he had a, a lecturing obligation that wasn't always a happy one for him to maybe also get away from the, from the meddling, uh, uh, um, sponsors that he had on the East Coast and regain a little bit of his autonomy. I can talk about that a little bit more later, but I've, I've gone on for a while. So, Thanks so much. I think it would be really interesting to get a clearer idea of Los Angeles as a city uh, where the months moved to in 1940, 1941, and then over this fascinating overview chapter for a book on, on the city and transition. And um, what struck me was the fact that um, people, refugees from Germany, um, yeah, found refuge in the safe haven, ten thousands of kilometers away from their home. But still, war and also the war economy uh, was the main factor that transformed or reshaped 
uh, Los Angeles in the beginning of the 40s. Do you want to elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you for that question. So I think one event that's like basically shaped the experience of many of the exiles here was, of course, the attack on Pearl Harbor and then the subsequent involvement of the United States in World War II. And, and it's, it's this interesting kind of like dynamic situation that on, on the one hand, California becomes this like economic powerhouse at the time because you have the, the booming aviation industry of you know, companies like Northrop, Douglas, uh, you know, built huge factories and then even some neighborhoods like emerge around these factories like Burbank or Hawthorne, for example. Um, so there's this huge influx and then the Hollywood film industry, for example, shifts into like anti-Nazi film production and they produce like 150 movies in three years. Um, so, and then of course, many housing projects and, 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 and whole resi residential neighborhoods emerge um, during that time. So it's really the time where California becomes this economic player in the United States and especially the greater LA um, area. Um, some even refer to it as like the second gold rush. So, but then on the other hand, there was also this highly paranoid atmosphere, especially after the attack on Pearl Harbor that I think many Californians feared that attack on California or specifically Los Angeles actually happened. Um, and I think that was followed by one significant event for many of the exiles, which was um, when the Department of Justice issued this executive order, uh, which was called Notice to Aliens of Na Enemy Nationalities in, in, in February of 42, um, when basically all of the um, Japanese, German and Italian residents had to um, uh, register as enemy aliens and then that was basically the legal framework for the encampment of like the, the many many Japanese prisoners in Manzanar and these sites but also uh, many of the um, German Jewish exiles and Italian exiles had to face curfews and it was harder to um, obtain visas and, and, and working permits so I think the, these events are kind of like the backdrop um, in front of all these actors who were acting in the city at that time. Um, which actually leads me to um, another question, um, perhaps um, for, for Alex, because um, when we look at you know, these things happening in LA at the time, and in your recent piece for um, the New Yorker, Thomas Mann's Brush with Darkness, you very vividly described this development of Thomas Mann from the Buddenbrooks to the Magic Mountain, and then kind of culminating in his like more modernist phase with Dr. Faustus. And um, so from his diaries and letters, we know that Thomas Mann was very much aware of what was going on around him in the city. He was like uh, seeing films and was going to the movies, listening to the radio. Um, uh, he, was, he, he knew what was going on in terms of like modernist uh, architecture movements at the time. So um, I was wondering if, you know, the city, the, the city's infrastructure and the city's cultural atmosphere at the time had some kind of impact on, on Thomas Mann as a, as a thinker and also as a writer? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, and uh, it's one that I'd like to sort of ponder and, and, and think about uh, more. Um, uh, uh, the, the sort of immediate response is, is to think, well, well, no, the books themselves uh, remain sort of at this plateau of, of, uh, of sort of Thomas Mann's um, Higher concerns uh, and, and sort of notion of a of a Californian atmosphere, I think, is especially difficult to find in Dr. Faustus, which is, of course, a very much a, a German uh, book. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, it, it it obviously bears the the influence of the the multinational, cosmopolitan, transnational uh, culture uh, that he was experiencing. Uh, here in Los Angeles, which despite the paranoia that you uh, mentioned, despite the, the, uh, uh, the, the nativist uh, uh, sentiments, uh, despite a, a kind of uh, quasi-fascistic structure uh, in terms of the, the police department and, and, the, and, the, and the real estate business and, and how it all sort of um, intersected, despite all that, it was a, a richly varied uh, city. Uh, he did not um, have, I think, um, uh, much contact, uh, uh, much awareness outside of a, 
of a Western European uh, Anglo-American uh, uh, sphere. Um, uh, but within that sphere, I think uh, it, he, he, he received many impulses that he, that he could find reflected um, in, uh, in Dr. Faust. So sort of the music that, that the fictional composer Adrian Leverkuhn is writing uh, in the novel is a reflection of uh, Schoenberg and Alban Berg, but also of uh, Stravinsky um, and, and uh, neoclassicism, perhaps a little bit of Hans Eisler, uh, perhaps even sort of a few hints of, of American uh, avant-garde or international uh, avant-garde tendencies. Um, and so, you know, while he is at the, uh, on the one hand a, uh, a purely uh, a German uh, being, a representative of all these all these complex and contradictory forces that Mann wanted to study in, in, in German history and German character. Uh, uh, he is also uh, a, a very expansive and, and, and multi-sided uh, and, and cosmopolitan figure, which I think is, is the, the very tension that Mann wanted to explore at the heart of uh, German art, uh, perhaps at the, at the heart of sort of art uh, seen in, in, in the widest sense that it can so often reflect the best and the worst, uh, the lightest and the darkest uh, tendencies in, in the human uh, character. And of course, he looked at all those forces within himself and within his own uh, history. So maybe in a sort of somewhat more uh, oblique level, you can see a, a, a Los Angeles uh, aspect uh, to the novel. But, um, but he was, yeah, he was very aware of, of the culture here, I think, more than, than we might gather from the image of this very reserved uh, uh, bourgeois, uh, uh, sort of grand European man of letters. I think one very entertaining aspect of this book is the discussion of Mann's visits to the movies um, and his uh, film reviews, so to speak. I mean, we could possibly have a, a spin-off volume of, of Thomas Mann's capsule film reviews. It would be a very short book uh, because the reviews are often just a few words. Uh, Doom <laughs> is, what the new, is the new C fairly often. Uh, but he did actually appreciate uh, the sophistication of what Hollywood was, was uh, uh, able to produce. He, he, he enjoyed uh, Lubitsch's uh, great comedies. Uh, although, unfortunately, I could not find a mention of to be or not to be uh, in, in the novels. I would have thought that that would be a film that would have particularly uh, interested him, uh, uh, Lubitsch's great anti-Nazi comedy. Um, uh, he, he very much admired Citizen Kane. Uh, he, he recognized uh, the, the greatness of Citizen Kane. Um, and he had to sort of occasional designs of, of writing something for Hollywood himself or sort of participating in, in the system uh, in, in, in some way. Um, and so he was a close observer of, of what was happening, even if you know, habitually the, the, the visual image was of him standing at a, at a far uh, remove. Um, and he socialized with, with Lubitsch. Uh, uh, they, they went to events uh, together, I think. They may have been slightly intimidated by each other uh, in, in a certain way, uh, but they, they did spend quite a bit of time together. Tobias, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah. Um, when I think about the way uh, in which Los Angeles influenced or did not influence uh, Thomas Mann's writing, I'm, I'm always drawn to a letter that he sent to his um, part-time assistant, Ida Hertz, when he first came to Los Angeles, where he um, wrote about how the uh, landscape here reminded him of Palestine and Egypt and how that was going to be amazing for the... Um, uh, for the Joseph novel, the, the final Joseph novel that he was working on um, at the time. And I think that's really important because if you look at Thomas Mann's writing on a very macroscopic level, I think you see a big shift that takes place right around 1930. Um, and in all the writing that he does prior to 1930, all the successful writing, at least all the, 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 um, the, the stories and novels that are still read today, he always starts with kernels of personal experience and then spins out from them, spins larger tales around them, right? Death in Venice, The Magic Mountain, all these stories, uh, they begin uh, with uh, experiences that he actually had. But if you look at his, his artistic production after 1930, uh, it, it completely changes. He starts by taking um, these epic stories, the story of uh, the Old Testament in the, in the Joseph uh, novels, Indian legend with uh, the Fatauschen Köpfe, the, the, uh, the, the, the transposed heads, 
uh, the story of Dr. Faustus, of course, right? He takes these, these, these giant legends and, and rewrites them in a modern register. But in order to do so successfully, he needs to find something from his own personal life that he can then inject into those, uh, into those tales. So it's a, it's a transposition of hierarchies. And the moment that he comes to LA and sees that, hey, this, this is like uh, Palestine, this is like, uh, like Egypt, I think he finds a way to connect this, this gigantic Joseph story that he's been writing for quite some time two contemporary events in the 1940s. Because of course the novel that he then produces, Joseph the Provider, ironically is probably, if there's an American novel that he ever wrote, it, it, it's that one, right? Even though it's set in ancient Egypt, simply because there's all these Americanisms of language uh, uh, in the novel, there's that, that whole allegorical thing where the New Deal gets, uh, gets transposed into the novel. And I think, that's it. When he when he when he disembarks here in L.A., he finally he, he figures that out that he can bring the war effort and America's role in um, in the world at that time, which he's as an as an emigre is obviously uh, quite interested in and, and quite hopeful about. He can he can bring that into the novel. So even though there's no direct sort of uh, literal influence of L.A. to be found in that book, I think that was a, a really key moment in his development as a writer. Well, thank you both very much. Um, perhaps uh, to zoom back in a bit again into the local community in, in Los Angeles, um, Donna, I wanted to ask you about um, this idea of an Excel community. So when we talk about the immigrants in LA, um, we often just refer to them as the exiles or the immigrants, or always uh, in terms of a community. Well, at the same time, there were many conflicts along the lines of class and gender. If we think of the big uh, uh, conflicts between, let's say, Bertolt Brecht and Thomas Mann or Alfred, Alfred Dublin and Thomas Mann, who accused Mann of uh, dealing with the problems of uh, villa owners um, while his own brother Heinrich was very much struggling to, to make a living here. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and even if we look at this community spatially, right, I mean, of course, there were many here on the west side, but at the same time, uh, many people also lived in, in East Hollywood and Pasadena. So, um, how would you des describe this um, sense of community uh, among the exiles or if this idea of a community is rather something we construct in, in retrospect to, to better grasp with the topic? Yeah, I think that maybe the only thing that this community of people had in common was the fact of their exile. They were, many of these animosities you're talking about were going on for years before in Europe and they just sort of carried over here. Um, certainly the case of Mann and Brecht and, and others. Um, and Isherwood in his diaries has wonderful descriptions at Salka Fiertel's house of the prickly atmosphere of her Sunday afternoon parties where you could just feel this sort of electric tension in the air. You know, nobody was especially happy to be there. They didn't expect to have established this community and they were Adorno has a line where he says that every, every refugee uh, feels his life to be in some way an amputation. And so this was how the experience of exile was playing itself out while there was this great disconnect of this gorgeous weather and this fantastic, you know, sort of tropical atmosphere um, that, that was on people's minds as they were wondering what was happening to their loved ones back in, in Germany and, and in Europe. And so, um, I think that it was helpful for them to have places to gather because they needed to, they needed to be with each other. It was, it was a solace for them, but there was no, I don't think there was any indication that they were all getting along necessarily ever. Um, and there, there are plenty of stories. And it's interesting that you bring that up to sort of in hindsight that we think of them as a sort of jolly community, but in fact, not at all the case, I don't think. Um, it was Salka Fiertel's great, um, talent to soothe over a lot of those tensions, um, to offer a piece of cake and just a sort of humble gestures, um, you know, to, to really listen to someone when they had a problem or to, you know, connect them to a driving instructor who might teach them how to drive. That was, you know, <laughs> the, the little things that sort of made their lives easier because in general, it was, a, it was very, very, very difficult for them to be here. Um, even for Thomas Mann with all of his you know, international connections and his, his income, his guaranteed income from his sales. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. 
But still, there were the, these centers of these people who brought together the, these quarreling exiles, right? And Zaka Viertel was one of them, maybe Feuchtwanger and Hans Eisler, others, right? And um, so they had a really crucial role, I guess, then in, in this emigre culture. Very much so, yes. Yeah. And then when more people started to come, they were able to introduce, you know, each other to, to generate, you know, these very important connections. Um, one example would be uh, the film composer Franz Voxman, who had come in, I think it was 1938, after being beaten and kicked in the streets. He, you know, of Berlin, he came, uh, found his way to Los Angeles and walked into Salka Viertel's house and was introduced to a sort of lanky guy in an armchair who, as soon as he heard his name, jumped up and said, I've been looking all over the world for you. You are the composer of my next movie. And that, that man was James Whale, the British director, who was preparing the, his film The Bride of Frankenstein and had heard Franz Voxman's score for um, a film called Lilium, a Fritz Lang film, and uh, was, was enchanted by the sort of ghost chorus of music that Voxman had put together. And so he he uh, arranged for him to score The Bride of Frankenstein. That started off an incredibly prolific career in Hollywood as well as um, engagement in the classical music community in Los Angeles. And then Voxman himself paid it forward by writing hundreds of affidavits for everyone who could, including a uh, family who was also named Voxman in, in Vienna who had seen his name randomly on some credits uh, on a film. and wrote the, the daughter wrote to him begging him for an affidavit and he, he ended up saving all of them he didn't know them he wasn't related to them he saved them all thank you yeah we should certainly also talk about this place right um, and maybe that's an opportunity to go back to the question of modernity there's this famous quote by katya mann in an interview with the la times she said it's a modern home we like it though <laughs> uh, and at the same time, it was, of course, a conscious de decision, right? Um, so in the beginning, they were in contact with different architects who uh, conceived more traditional Spanish colonial style villas. But in the end, they decided to collaborate with J.R. Davidson, a very modernist um, Californian um, German-born architect. And maybe a question to Alex, do you think that this modern at least outer structure of the house at the time was also a commitment to Californian modernism in a more broader sense. I mean, it was, of course, yeah, like I said, a conscious decision and was in a way representative to a certain, of a certain attitude here culturally. No, possibly he, he did consciously wish to in, engage with the architectural uh, traditions uh, here. On that first visit to 1938, he met with Richard Neutra, um, and went on apparently a, a, a driving tour, uh, as it's described in Moth's diaries, where I assume Neutra was showing him some of his uh, better known houses in the area. Perhaps they went to the, the Lovell Health House in, in Los Feliz, or the uh, the Kuhn House uh, over here on the west side, or various others. Um, it, it was not a successful encounter. Um, uh, Mon was somewhat alarmed by the severity of, of Neutra's architecture in that period, a uh, period where, where Neutra was really strongly identified with uh, uh, the international style uh, with, with a very sort of strict application of some of these modernist uh, principles. Um, uh, a sensibility that Neutra himself was actually in the process of shifting away from. Uh, and I think if he had built the Bond House in the 19, early 1940s, it would have looked uh, much different. Uh, if you think about the, the great uh, Kaufman House in, in Palm Springs, uh, that is a house with a less severe, uh, a certain kind of um, uh, a, a sort of a, a sensuality in terms of the way that the forms of the house uh, interact. Um, but uh, I think uh, for those reasons of, of taste, and also there are some questions I think about uh, personality conflicts, uh, Mann found Neutra somewhat overbearing, as many people found Neutra a bit uh, overbearing. Um, and so uh, Davidson was uh, 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 an architect, first of all, just with, with a more reserved manner, who I think would have treated uh, uh, Mann with the kind of uh, uh, dignity that, that he would have uh, expected. Um, 
and also sort of Davidson's version of modernism uh, had had a, a, a somewhat uh, a softer edge. It's, it's, it's in this house and some other Davidson houses uh, uh, around LA uh, are not of of the of the sort of brand of the uh, international style. Um, but these you know these these. These differences tend to blur when, when you when you really get down to it, because uh, you know, as I said, Neutra himself uh, was was evolving in terms of his architectural style. And then you had Schindler, uh, who was very radical, very imaginative, but never a sort of doctrinaire international style architect. He sort of had his own thing that he was doing really before the international style existed. Um, but yeah, that's it's a good question. I don't I don't see any. Uh, sort of unmistakable evidence of, of Mann saying, yes, I want to sort of engage with this uh, uh, style of architecture, but it's striking that it happened. And a number of the other Adam Grays wished uh, uh, to, to engage with this uh, uh, native school of architecture for various reasons. Many of them did not. Uh, uh, Arnold Schoenberg uh, talked to Neutra about a house project which didn't uh, come to pass. And, and he ended up living in a, in a much more uh, traditional uh, looking house down there on, on Rockingham. Um, and Billy Wilder actually uh, had, had ideas about uh, a modernist house that he uh, never went through with. Um, but yeah, I think this is, it's, 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 these connections are fascinating. And, and uh, uh, you know, even as we talk about the animosities and the differences, you know, there were also these, these intellectual uh, connections and the sort of convergence around a complex idea of modernism, not sort of uh, not a, a, a strict, perhaps abrasive or, 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 or sort of aggressive uh, modernism, but something uh, uh, somewhat more popular in spirit. And people have talked about vernacular modernism and, and that Hollywood modernism, the progressivism uh, of some of the Hollywood films of, uh, of the 1930s uh, and 40s. I think you could talk about Lubitsch as a, as a, as a modernist filmmaker in a certain way. And, and so that sort of more broadly defined uh, Mon and this house and many of these other figures fit into that uh, concept. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating that you mentioned this kind of ambiguous relationship that Mann had to many of these more modern developments. I mean, um, especially when, it, when we look at his um, relationship um, with popular media. I mean, on the one hand, like from, from the diaries, we're very much aware that Mann basically you know, listened to the radio to live the Hollywood Bowl on Sundays. He saw movies sometimes like two or three times a week. Um, he was a huge fan of the gramophone, had a record collection, um, even dedicated a chapter to the gramophone in the Magic Mountain. Um, and uh, I mean, until he left LA, he was still kind of imagining a movie of the uh, a mo movie adaptation of the Joseph saga. So, um, and Tobias, uh, perhaps there's a question for you: like, what do you, what do you think can we make of this ambiguous relationship between Thomas Mann and pop popular media? Because it seems that on the one hand, he um, saw the potential of these media constellations and technologies, but um, at the same time, he kind of still had this idea of like low bro, bro versus high culture uh, uh, conflict within him. Yeah, I mean, we certainly, when we think of popular media, Thomas Mann is not the first name that comes to mind, right? Um, but Mann was actually very adept at uh, manipulating or accommodating himself to new media. That, that starts uh, already long before he immigrates to the United States uh, with a form of, of new medium that, we, that to us doesn't even seem that new anymore, namely uh, revolutions in book publishing that allow much cheaper books uh, uh, to be produced uh, beginning in the 1920s. And this is a process that eventually culminates with the invention of the paperback uh, in the late 1930s and, and early 1940s. And um, Mann sort of famously uh, pushes his German publisher, uh, Samuel Fischer, uh, to publish a cheap edition of, um, uh, of of Buddenbrooks, right? It's, uh, it's yeah, <laughs> of Buddenbrooks uh, uh, in the um, in the nineteen twenties. And Fisher is at first really resistant to that endeavor, but then gives in, and it becomes a huge bestseller. I mean, it becomes the best-selling German book of all time, right? 
And uh, by contrast, many of Thomas Mann's contemporaries at the time were still insisting that because they were authors of quality, they had to be produced in these, these intricately bound, uh, uh, very expensively designed uh, tomes. Uh, and over the course of the 1920s, that, that slowly went by the way. That was no longer the way in which publishing um, worked, and Thomas Mann understood that. Another example is that uh, Thomas Mann is the first uh, uh, German author ever to appear on television in Germany at a time when television is still a highly experimental medium, when there aren't, in fact, uh, television sets in, in, in popular households. This is in the, in the early 1930s. He's already, uh, uh, he's on there. And then when we now uh, move to the United States, um, there's a number of examples that, that, that we can cite. Of course, the most important one uh, uh, in relationship to Los Angeles would be his work uh, on, on radio. So uh, through the intervention of, of his daughter, Erika, he gets sort of uh, hooked up with uh, a, uh, a gig to uh, record these uh, essentially propaganda lectures uh, for the BBC that are then broadcast into Europe. Um, and so he, he regular, regularly goes to the NBC studios here in Hollywood and, and uh, records his lectures there uh, and does that with, um, with great gusto and, and, and great skill. Um, and these are all really important moments of, uh, of his development as a public intellectual uh, here in, in L.A. So. Thank you for that. Maybe we can focus a bit on the trivial sides of the book. <laughs> His poodle and <laughs> traveling. Traveling was fascinating to me. Of course, this lecture tours um, in the late 1930s one wouldn't be possible. Wouldn't have been possible without traveling um, through a railway. Right? He had a yeah. quite intimate relationship to the beautiful Los Angeles Union Station. Uh, that's this nice ane or anecdote where he heard about the death of Heinrich Himmler at Union Station and he immediately ordered a big meal of chopsticks and, <laughs> and, and a beer to celebrate this occasion. Um, but he mentions dozens of times Union Station and also the trains. He had a favor for luxurious um, trains from Chicago to Los Angeles. Maybe one of you do want to talk a bit about traveling and Thomas Mann, of course, literary that was also of importance for him. There's this famous um, novella, Eisenbahn Unglück, uh, already published in, in, in the teens. Um, um, is there something more you want to share? Well, I can. I I can go ahead because that's that's something that my my book uh, talks about quite extensively. Yeah, there's as somebody who you know lives in 21st century America and has a not so great and intimate relationship with LAX airport. The um, the the, the the joy that that Thomas Mann uh, takes in train travel and and uh, in this in this infrastructure uh, is, is something that really speaks to me as as sort of um, a bygone era um, and and yeah the, the trains were really important to uh, get Thomas Mann into parts not just uh, from places like Chicago or New York to LA but also into parts of the country uh, that other emigres simply did not travel to. And I think that's one of the distinctive um, uh, things about Thomas Mann. The train was a, a, a mode of conveyance that allowed Thomas Mann to reach parts of America that other emigres simply did not get to. And Hans Rudolf Vagin, his great book, Thomas Mann the Americana, has talked about this um, quite a bit, that, it, that it, it, it gave him a perspective of America that was simply foreclosed to um, to other emigres. Uh, uh, it gave them insights into life in other parts of the country that they uh, maybe didn't have, and it allowed for social interactions that those other emigres didn't have. Uh, Thomas Mann didn't always luxuriate in those, in those social interactions. He hated being asked uh, questions, uh, especially dumb questions by audience members at the end of his, and he thought a lot of questions were dumb. Uh, <laughs> at, at, at the end of his talks, he hated having to socialize with you know, university professors uh, uh, like myself, at the uh, at, at the end of collegiate appearances and so on, but these were still important uh, uh, ways of, of bringing him into the country and also bringing the country into his intellectual horizon. Yeah, you. Um, I would like to talk a little bit more about the um, the community here in LA, if that's okay. Um, and I, I'm just so curious to learn a bit more about. Um, 
Salkas salons um, because I, I I love that part in, in, in your book, Donna, when you describe um, this situation at, um, I think it was Heinrich Mann's 70th birthday. It's uh, May 41 and like 50 people gather at Salkas home. And I'm, I'm having a hard time to imagine how it must have been like because on the one hand, there's like uh, chocolate cake and like lots of beer served. But then on the other hand, Salka remembers Thomas Mann is like having the reserved politeness of an official dip diplomat and duty. So um, I, I'm just trying to better understand like what the atmosphere was like during these gatherings. Like, uh, because it seemed so official on the one hand, and, and then, but on the other hand, it was kind of like a private gathering. So, mm. Well, the 70th birthday party was not representative of Salka's Sunday afternoon at all. That was a very special occasion. It was um, formal. It was... There was much discussion about the guest list and who would be invited and who would be, you know, sort of stuck in the kitchen looking out because they wanted to be involved but hadn't been invited. But but actually, the the Sunday afternoon parties were quite casual and, and improvisational and ve a very different atmosphere. Um, it was the one day that the studios had uh, studio employees did not work, so it was their time to really relax, and they took advantage of it. And in Los Angeles, which is very much a city of houses, people congregated at people's houses. They did not go to these nightclubs or restaurants unless, um, most often unless they were, you know, working, whether it was a sort of, you know, a PR uh, appearance at these places. And they met at each other's houses. And so Sunday afternoon, they, they knew that the door on Mayberry Road was always open. And very often, Thomas Mann and Katja were there. Um, and Salka loved to introduce him to this or that sort of quivering newcomer. And, you know, she, as a former actress, really enjoyed the sort of drama of it. You know, it's, he would take their hand and give them a benevolent look and pretend to be interested. And they would, you know, it was like the highlight of their lives. Um, and, but he also, rather humbly, loved her chocolate cake and was often there specifically for the chocolate cake <laughs> and in fact once went to a wedding reception for a couple he didn't know because he heard that Salka was bringing the cake. <laughs> um, so but this this was a, a cake that she had made that reminded him probably of, of the cakes he had had in Europe and, and it, it meant something to him more than just cake it meant home it meant you know someone was looking after him it, it meant you know just a little bit of sweetness in his life. And, and everyone felt that way about Salka's cooking. She was just a fantastic cook. And, and she uh, also, as a former actress, was able to sort of command the room and, and um, strike a pose. And it was just, it was fun to be there. It was relaxing and fun for people whose daily lives were not relaxing and fun at all. So um, that was an important part of, of the community there. Um, but again, the 70th birthday party was an entirely different affair. And... It's often talked about in sort of comic ways because uh, it was Heinrich's 70th birthday and he and Thomas both read these sort of stentorian speeches to each other. And so people kind of make fun of that. But in fact, I think it was very touching because they were talking about the nature of their exile and, and how they had avoided you know, the bullets that were meant for them and how grateful they were to be in a country that took them in. Um, and when you read these speeches, you see, oh, this isn't funny at all. This is, this is really intense. And of course, Salka was in the background fretting that her roast beef was getting way overdone because the speeches were going on too long. But um, I, for one, would love to have been there and seen and see what happened there. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I absolutely love the story about showing up at the stranger's wedding and I sort of think about, you know, people looking at him, so who's that strange man? Did, does anyone know him? <laughs> a very irregular event, I think, in the Thomas Mann bog, showing up at perfect stranger's house uh, with no pressing reason to be there, except for the cake. That <laughs> was quite a pressing reason from this point. Yeah, Donna and Alex, maybe as Angelina has a question um, regarding contemporary LA. Do you feel that this legacy of emigres is visible today? It's visible enough today in Los Angeles. Of course, there's the Thomas Mann House and Villa Aurora. Um, there are places like the Brecht House or also Zaka Viertel's House, which are now in private ownership. But where do you see 
hidden treasures and further potential. I know, Alex, you participated also in this civic memory working group, right, by the city of LA with this fabulous report that was released a while ago. And um, maybe do have recommendations <laughs> how to <laughs> even amplify and make it more visible in this, um, this era. Um, yes, well, uh, uh, Christopher Hawthorne is, is uh, here who uh, oversaw this. Um, uh, uh, fascinating uh, uh, reports on on how we remember and how we should remember uh, events in in Los Angeles uh, history, um, which can be found uh, online. It makes very very interesting uh, reading, um, and and so I contributed a, a few uh, small thoughts about um, the uh, immigration, and I think it, it it should be more visible. You know exactly how it should be made visible is. Is a difficult question, but I think it's a history that um, a, a lot of people in Los Angeles, uh, sort of generally kind of cultured and, and, and literary people, are uh, have only a scant uh, awareness of, um, if at all. And they will be aware of the of the Hollywood uh, people uh, who came. Um, but the fact that most of German literature, <laughs> uh, uh, most of great German literature, uh, was was here um, in Los Angeles in the 1940s. Uh, the, the fact of the architecture, which is never, I think, thought of alongside uh, the other emigre stories, because technically they weren't emigres. They, they, they didn't flee uh, Nazi Germany. They were already here um, in the 1920s or, or even earlier. But nonetheless, there are uh, important connections. So how, how would we best remember it? Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know whether there could be uh, stars uh, in the sidewalk at the Brentwood Country Mart <laughs> or, uh, or billboards with quotations from uh, Adorno or, or, or Brecht, uh, probably not. But I think, but I think they, there, there could be, um, you know, online guides, and there already are some, uh, uh, sort of ways to move around through the city um, and, and remember, even if you don't see a, a monument or a plaque, uh, uh, to have the sense of, you know, uh, Vicky Baum lived um, in this house just right, right nearby. Uh, Hans Eisler, Max Horkheimer, uh, uh, all the all the amazing actors. So many extraordinary actors uh, uh, came over. Albert Bassermann, absolute giant of the of the of the German theater. All these all these figures who had worked with Max Reinhardt uh, as well as Max Reinhardt himself. So everywhere you go, you know, uh, you you can you can see these houses and and you can. And you can um, think about the, the the fact of exile and the difficulty of exile. And you know, I have to say this: at this particular moment in American history, you know, as long as I've been interested in, in the stories of exile, it's always seemed a very abstract, uh, a kind of fantastical thing. Maybe the idea of going into into exile, you know, as sort of unimaginable. And you know, I'm not the only one who has had the thought, you know, cross their minds of well. What would it be like uh, to have to go into, into exile? What would be required? Um, and then once you start thinking along those lines, you quickly realize why so many people stayed and did not leave because it's so difficult uh, to imagine. So I think at this moment in history, to think about refugee stories, uh, exile stories, uh, tales of survival, uh, even of success, and also tales of defeat and, and misery. Uh, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary chapter in the history of this city and, and in the history of uh, culture of the 20th century. And I certainly hope more ways can be found to make people aware of it. Yeah, I, I would add to the great lesson for me in, in the research of this exile community was that everything local has global reverberations and everything global uh, sort of matters to you locally. And I... Personally, I'm a Los Angeles native. Show of hands, any other LA natives here? Oh, lots. Um, and when I was growing up, there was not a mention of any of this part of our Los Angeles history, not in school, not anywhere. And the sort of prevailing idea was that if you wanted culture, you had to go to the East Coast because it just didn't exist in Los Angeles. But in fact, as the playwright Sam Berman said, you know, there was a time in our history where Los Angeles was as crowded with artists as Renaissance Florence, and it had never happened before, and it probably wouldn't happen again. And if, I think if I had known that, if I, if I had been taught that in school, I would have paid more attention to my history lesson because most of it was incredibly boring about the missions and things growing on about that. But, but uh, 
that was what actually was able to connect me to my history as a as a Los Angeles native was learning about uh, people who came from somewhere else and and were able to put a spotlight on a city as outsiders in a way that insiders themselves could not see. They were able to find a vocabulary for the city that other people had trouble reading. Um, and I think that's true now. Um, with, I'm very grateful for the Villa Aurora and the Thomas Mann House for doing the same, for, for having a, a, a sort of outsider perspective to illuminate what this city is and what it has been and what it means. Um, and I would, I would definitely agree. I'd like to see more of that. There are ghosts everywhere, the houses, the, um, you know, the echoes of, of people who were here who shaped our culture, who shaped the film world, who shaped um, a lot of things that we take for granted as specifically Californian or not. They are, they are you know, examples of the marks that these emigres made on the time, during the time that they were here. It was very powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I think this might be a good um, time to perhaps open up the uh, discussion to our audience today. Um, if there are any questions? Thanks. Um, I really enjoyed the description of uh, Thomas Mann and uh, Ernst Lubitsch as mutually intimidated <laughs> by each other. And uh, I just wondered whether Mann had any more extensive interest or interpretation of the silver screen writing for it. And also, whether he knew Wilder. Uh, I don't think he knew Wilder. Uh, and actually, several of, quite a few of, of Billy Wilder's films are, are mentioned in the diaries. Um, uh, he liked uh, Sunset Boulevard. Uh, he saw uh, The Last Weekend, I believe, uh, uh, Five Graves to Cairo. Uh, he seemed to um, uh, enjoy them. There's some kind of comment along the way that it was a, that it was it was a bit a bit aggressive or a bit <laughs> I forget what the word was. Globe, perhaps globe. Globe. Uh, yeah. globe uh, how would you translate globe? Uh, rough. What, rough. Rough. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but I don't think he knew him uh, personally. Um, uh, there, there were flirtations. I mean, as you mentioned the Joseph Project. Um, there was a, a treatment, a very curious story um, uh, called The Woman with a Hundred Faces that he worked on with Lewis, the novelist Lewis Bromfield. A very complicated story of this woman who's painted by all these different painters and then, and then her husband is obsessed by the paintings and is gathering them and he sort of goes insane and she disappears. Uh, you know, it's an interesting story. Uh, most interesting was the fact that, that Thomas Mann and, and, and Louis Bromfield are speaking characters in the script, uh, which raises the possibility that, that was Thomas Mann going to play himself in, in this <laughs> film? I don't know. Uh, but he, there's lines for a character named Thomas Mann um, as he, he and Louis Barnfield go to this auction and start exploring the story. Um, uh, Jean Renoir actually was, was interested in pursuing that movie, but it, fortunately or unfortunately, it, it never got made. Um, but no, he, I think he was, he was curious. He didn't want to probably be seen as pursuing Hollywood or sort of having Hollywood uh, ambitions. Um, but I, I think the idea of a major Hollywood film based on, on one of his books or even a story that, that, that he invented uh, uh, for the purpose um, uh, appealed to him strongly because he, he, knew, he knew from Citizen Kane, he knew from other uh, 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 movies that, that Hollywood was capable of, of making major works of art. Um, he did not have the attitude that, that there was some irrevocable divide between, between uh, high and low. He, he recognized uh, the potential of, of Hollywood artistically, as well as simply enjoying its products on, on a much more <laughs> uh, casual level. And I mean, is it true that he uh, suggested to Walt Disney that um, that Disney make a film based on the work of Felix Salton and, and in fact, uh, the movie Bambi. I read that somewhere. I don't know about that, so... I do know that, that he went to see Bambi and several times and was enthralled by yeah, it. He, he loves, loves Bambi. Yeah. He absolutely loves Bambi. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Bambi and nice Citizen movie. Kane, I think, are the two movies <laughs> that are most highly praised in <laughs> Thomas Lodge's capsule of film reviews, so... <laughs> but I think it's so interesting that, like, if we actually look at the um, diary entries in which he talks about movie, how, movies, how detailed they are sometimes. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, for example, 
um, so much, sometimes he comments on like when he saw his first movie in Technicolor, The Lady in the Dark. He's like, that might be an interesting color technique uh, in regards to a potential Joseph film, for example. Mm -hmm. um, or he comments on certain editing techniques. So uh, I think it's interesting to see how savvy he actually was with the term terminology and like how the, the medium of film actually worked to convey a certain story. Mm. And it was certainly meaningful for Thomas Mann. I found a correspondence between William Dieterle and Thomas Mann, I think from 1954, so very shortly before Thomas Mann's death. And Dieterle wrote from Los Angeles to Thomas Mann in Zurich about the Joseph project. So until the last months of his life, he still had hopes to accomplish this project. Mm -hmm. And a Felix Kroll movie as well was, was talked about, which did happen shortly after his death. I know that some of these uh, Hemingways had children, and I was wondering if the fact that they had children might have sort of helped them anchor kind of a, 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 a integration into the community of Los Angeles, especially Donna, the children of the Tonka. They were young, and I know, well, you tell the story about them. Yes, they, they were very young when they came to Los Angeles and quickly transformed from little shorts wearing German boys into, you know, bronze California surfing boys. And they would go down Mayberry Road to some steps where there was a little tunnel and it would go under the highway and dump them out right on the beach. So that was really their front yard and they would spend time, you know, surfing every time they weren't, uh, didn't have to do homework, they were out on the beach. So um, I think that it was, hard for them to have parents who were foreigners from their point of view, for them to fit into schools and um, into the, the life of the other children around the Santa Monica colony. Uh, but uh, there was, uh, it definitely shaped them because they were at all of these Sunday afternoon parties and they were required to bow to people they were meeting for the first time. And there were certain European uh, traditions that they were expected to maintain. But at the same time, there was a sort of sunny Californian environment uh, in the house as well. So it was a little bit of a push-pull, as it is for every child of, of immigrant parents, I think. Um, and I'm sure this was true, as you say, for all of the children of immigrants. And, um, you know, every story is different. But, um, you know, for them to think of themselves as Californians and Americans was important to them. And, and all three of them uh, served in some capacity in the United States Army during World War II and were very proud to do that. Um, it was very important to them. It was a sort of a referendum on their manhood and their, and their lives as Americans. And I think it was a way to um, be American, but also to uh, defend the land that their parents had come from, uh, to, to defend the values that they had left behind that they felt were being perverted by Hitler. The, the we don't want to put anyone on the spot, but we do have a couple of people in the audience who might be able to shed more light. Uh, does, does, uh, does anyone want to speak on this question of what it's like to grow up as the child? Nicola? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It never occurred to me. Um, first of all, daddy died when I was little, but my mother was English. Um, no, it occurred to me more when I lived in Denmark later and I wanted to come home and be somewhere where James Dean was from <laughs> and not have to live uh, over in Europe. But, you know, my father spoke German. I mean, Santa Claus had a German accent. It never occurred to me to wonder uh, that he didn't. Mommy said that he, she wanted to call me Jillian and he couldn't pronounce it. He said alien. So... Um, <laughs> No, I, I don't think I really ever did think about it. I just, he was, I, mean, I think you, you have what you get, you know? I mean, and there were other people. I mean, Vicki Wilder's father spoke, had a German accent and, you know, the Wild, Wilder kids, Willie Wilder spoke with an accent, so everybody had an accent. It didn't seem weird at all. Anyway. I just wanted to know after all what they did here, finally the family moved back to Switzerland. Can you? shed some light why they went back leaving such a beautiful soap cow. The one word answer to that is McCarthyism, right? I mean, and and uh, the, the witch hunts, the anti-communist witch hunts uh, uh, of that of that time period, it was suddenly no longer a, a, 
uh, as a particularly good place for for them to live. And there's a there's a salutary lesson um, there. I think in Thomas Mann's case, uh, it's also even uh, even without the political environment, his, his literary star was fading. Um, the the literary scene in America after the Second World War was uh, uh, was changing quite a bit. And I think, I mean, this is not uh, uh, acknowledged as much in the, in the secondary literature on him, but I, but I personally think that that had a lot to do with it as well. He was suddenly no longer as successful uh, in the U.S. and he decided to to return to, to Europe, but certainly by far the overriding uh, 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 reason why people leave the United States at that point is that... Um, it is no longer the the, the welcoming uh, place that it was during the Roosevelt years. It's as simple as that. Yeah, just to briefly, uh, I, I feel as though I should apologize here uh, at, in this place uh, for what the New Yorker magazine uh, wrote about uh, Thomas Mann uh, <laughs> at, at the time. Uh, in the 1940s, there were some very sarcastic and dismissive uh, reviews. Um, uh, one uh, it was referring to this, uh, Knopf kept calling Mann the greatest living man of letters. Um, and, and I think it was Joseph, the provider, uh, raised the question the critic wrote of whether Thomas Mann is the greatest living bore. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize for that. <laughs> I wondered if Mann and his circle had acquaintance with the great German scientists who visited here in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Einstein, Frank, Walter Beide, who was actually quarantined on Mount Wilson during the war. Um, just wondered about that. And I have a tiny suggestion about Isaka Birkel's recipe for chocolate cake is known. <laughs> Why not publish it? <laughs> I actually, I do have the recipe and I have made it. And it is, it involves about a pound of butter <laughs> and good. about as much sugar. So I'm not sure you actually want to try it. <laughs> it's an interesting question about the, the scientists. Um, uh, Einstein, of course, he knew at Princeton. Yeah. Um, less less so out here, but perhaps you know of some, some connection. Can you know that he was in touch with Hans Reichenbach, the philosopher from UCLA, oh, yeah. right? They met several times for lunch. I'm not entirely sure what resulted or um, yeah, came out of those encounters or this relationship, but he was at least in touch also with philosophers at UCLA. And, and yeah, of course, also Ludwig Macuse, for example, but they were part of this community, right? And so there were several social researchers and philosophers. Macuse had a chair at UC, uh, USC then later on. Um, yeah. He was aware of the possibility of, of the atomic bomb during World War II. There's sort of veiled references to it in, a couple of times in the diaries and in a couple of letters, I think, from one source or another. Uh, he was... He, he had a strong inkling that this that, that project was underway. Um, I'm struck um, at the comparison, the similarities and the differences between the artists, um, the gallerists, and the um, um, art historians who went to the East Coast, um, and the writers, musicians, you know, film world, you know, who came to the to, to the West Coast. And I think, as Donna said, you know, you go where where you've got you know a group. Um, but I don't know any study that actually has looked at them as kind of two different kinds of groups in parallelism, and I actually think it would be kind of fascinating. Were there among the European um, emigrants those who spoke out um, against the um, anti-Japanese, you know, the sending Japanese to the, the, to the camps? I mean, I've never, I've never encountered it, but I just... In her memoir, The Kindness of Strangers, mentions the internment, and she notices at the Grand Central Market that those Japanese purveyors of fruit were no longer there and had been replaced, and she was, you know, clearly angry about it, but I don't know whether she uh, made it part of her activism yeah. to speak I mean, it's just interesting to, to see with what was going on in Europe, mm -hmm. what would they do? Yeah. I'm probably not the right person to talk about American history, but still, Thomas Mann was part of this committee. I forgot the name of this committee related uh, to enemy aliens and also the destiny of uh, the Japanese here in California and also internment camps. 
he and Bruno Frank were part of this committee, but Thomas Mann only addressed the situation of German immigrants here in California. And I tried also, I also had your question in mind and tried to find a source whether he also addressed um, the situation of Japanese people here in California. I think he didn't. He didn't. At least he was successful with Bruno Funk and others, of course, um, to avoid a curfew and other kinds of um, restrictions for uh, German, um, usually Jewish refugees here in the US. Yeah, I, I think that's a stain on Thomas Mann's record, to be totally frank, that he uh, he appeared in front of the Toland committee. He had a stage where he could have said something. And it was not, it wasn't just that he showed up in front of this committee and, and said a few words. It was clearly a self-consciously important um, occasion for him. Uh, the, 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 what he said there, uh, I, I think that was a, a transitional moment for him uh, in his uh, self-perception as a public intellectual in America, because he goes in front of that committee and he basically says, "I'm I'm ready to do war work for the United States," you know, and that's that's a, uh, that's a strong statement to make. So he, he clearly thought about what he would say uh, in front of the committee, and yet there's 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 nothing said about the internment of the Japanese. And uh, I mean, it's of course always easy to judge and condemn uh, from with hindsight, but uh, still, I think that that is a really important missed opportunity. It's at least an interesting footnote that the, the maids here, the housekeepers at this house, um, had a very diverse background. So um, they were accompanied by um, the maids from Princeton, first of all, African-Americans who worked at this house for several years. And then a lot of interesting footnotes, also, also problematic ones, so I have to admit. Um, and Thomas Mann's diaries regarding um, this couple, also this, the next couple was a Japanese-American couple who came directly out of an internment camp in Northern California to, to the Mann family's home. And that's something also Ben and I wanted to investigate in a further publication, how this uh, broader social issues of the time were in a way represented also in the um, structure here of, 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 um, of um, the employees said that Thomas Mann was back then. How intact is the house compared to when the man's lived here? It depends. So if you have a look from uh, to the outer, uh, outer shape of the house, it's more or less the same. You see this lower pergola that was added then during the renovation after 2016 when the German government bought the house. Also this suite here downstairs where one of our fellows lived at the moment was extended towards the pool. But apart from that, it's more or less original. Um, there were some windows added to the staircase on the back of the house. Inside of the house, there were a lot, a lot, a lot of remodeling done after 2016 because now it's um, the home for five fellows who are also amongst us today and have their own bathroom. So we have the necessities of a modern culture institution, which is, of course, uh, different compared to a single family home in the 1940s. The swimming pool was added after. Mon left uh, by the by the following owners uh, who owned the house all the way up until uh, the German government uh, bought it. So there were some modifications uh, at that time, uh, but but uh, some aspects of the the house, as I understand it, were restored more toward the way it had looked <clears throat> in Mon's time. Yeah, I mean there are certain parts of his study that are still intact. I think the bookshelves are um, the uh, the entrance door, the main door. I think is still original from the nineteen from the nineteen forties. The kitchen, the, the some some parts of the kitchen, yeah. So there are still some some aspects of the of the house that are still that still connect with the time when the man's lived here. I, I was uh, struck by the uh, comment about the visit of Erica and Klaus Mann already in nineteen twenty seven here in Hollywood, and I was wondering uh, how, uh, to return to the theme of children, how the uh, how Erica and Klaus Mann. Uh, these experiences here then evolved together with Thomas and if also in the book there, uh, How the Man Children Figured. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to read this travel report and they did not only visit uh, German Hollywood stars, but also a lot of American public events. For example, I think her name was M.A. McPherson, so a Pentecostal preacher in downtown LA and they attended one of her services. and. Yeah, in a very uh, colloquial, fun manner, they described this 
um, yeah, this public service, they attended the baseball game in Pasadena, they uh, spoke to Upton Sinclair, which was um, fascinating for me to read because they were so impressed by the role of American public intellectuals back then, and they compared it also to the role of Thomas Mann in Germany. Then, and, and they, they were impressed how committed Upton Sinclair was to the social question um, of his time, and you, know, you can already anticipate that they wished to have their father to, to get a, in a more um, active role. And that became true, of course, when Thomas Mann himself came to Los Angeles for the first time in 1938. So yeah, it's definitely worth reading. I'm not entirely sure whether this travel report, Rundherum is a German title, is available in English. I had, I had a question about uh, post-war and how you characterize the evolution or the dissolution of the emigrate community in Los Angeles after Mann left, after, well, Brecht left. Uh, how would you characterize the, the sort of the network or the, the com community such as it was? Many of the exiles actually stayed. If we think of actors like Peter Lorre, for example, I think he had a longer lasting career in, in Hollywood, but also I think the Feuchtwangers. Uh, I think they mostly didn't leave because they didn't, they weren't able to get an American passport. So uh, they would have probably had a hard time coming back. Um, and I think especially um, um, exiles working in the movie industry were those that rather tend to stay towards leaving. Uh, but then again, it was mostly, I think, the, of course, the Frankfurt schoolers, uh, the philosophers, uh, Brecht, I mean, he was one of the, the first who left because he was, I think, summoned in front of the House of un American Activities Co Committee already in 47, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's striking, I think, the stories of the, of the Hollywood figures are very different from the literary figures. Uh, almost all of the literary, major literary figures um, went back, or in the case of uh, uh, Franz Werfel uh, and Heinrich Mann, uh, they died here. Uh, um, uh, Mann, Heinrich Mann was, was planning to go back at the time of his death. Um, whereas with um, a lot of the, uh, the Hollywood people, um, I think especially thinking about the actors, um, I, I've noticed that a great many of them, even after they retired, or even after their careers turned out to be quite short-lived here, because to be an actor you know, in, the, in the 1940s, you basically had bit parts as, as a Gestapo colonel or, or as, a, as a, someone's wife, uh, you know, the Gestapo colonel's wife. Uh, um, and, uh, and those parts obviously dried up um, after 1945. But I, I noticed that, uh, that a lot of them just still stayed and, and lived out their lives um, uh, in uh, Los Angeles. Um, and so I think there would have been networks uh, that they had that, that sort of kept them here. Um, uh, just the many, many connections they would have made in, in the film business over the years. Whereas I think for the, for the literary figures, once some of them started to leave, once several of them died, suddenly it was a, it was a much, much uh, smaller and more isolated community. And, and it was a fairly small and isolated uh, uh, community to, to begin with. Um, then you also have the composers. Um, and uh, 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 Schoenberg uh, lived out his uh, life here. Uh, his sons um, uh, still live um, in the Los Angeles uh, area. And so that's, that's a, a family that, that uh, put down uh, roots uh, here very strongly. Uh, the Korngold family, uh, there's still many, many Korngolds um, uh, on the well, West Coast. Here with us in the audience yes. today. There's one more question over there. It's just a thank you because um, I'm so happy that the German government prevailed in buying the house because our homeowners association in the Riviera was very nervous about this happening, uh, worried about traffic and all sorts of things. And so we're really pleased that it, it's brought really a wonderful intellectual flavor to the neighborhood. So thank you. Thank the government. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Germany. <laughs> We are so happy to be welcomed in this neighborhood here and that so many of our neighbors also attend our events here and um, are loyal supporters of the house and uh, it's a, a wonderful development.
yeah, perhaps uh, to to end this and go over to the uh, snacks and drinks part, I would just have like one very last question. Um, if you could take any of the notable exiles um, um, for a drink, let's say at the Swiss chalet on Wiltshire, who would it be and what would you order for him or her? <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to answer, obviously. Okay, I mean, can I, is, is it too cheap an answer to say Thomas Mann since I wrote a book on the guy? I mean, I, I would obviously like to have uh, dinner with him. And I'd probably just order him a big cheeseburger because I'd like to see Thomas Mann eat a cheeseburger. <laughs> uh, I will say Eris Lubitsch. Uh, and also order the cheeseburger. That's very good. I'm sure he may make a wonderful comedic routine out of the, of the cheeseburger. <laughs> and I too would have to say I would absolutely like to invite Salka Virtal and have somebody else cook for her because she was always cooking for everybody else. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for asking such great questions.